Thank you, Carl, and thank you, Kate, for joining us. Um, Carl writes in the magazine this week as, a, as part of our cover piece about the COVID inquiry and about what it's looking at and in particular what it's not looking at. Um, it's been in the news a lot this week because Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane have appeared in front of the inquiry. Uh, Kate, to, to start us off, what, what have you made of the inquiry so far? I think one of the big concerns around this inquiry, John, wasn't just how long it was going to take, but that there might be a predetermined set of conclusions that the inquiry was, tr was trying to seek out, predominantly that lockdown didn't happen fast enough and that it wasn't hard enough. And I'm afraid to say I think some of those fears may be coming to light. And, and, and I don't say that casually. Look at what we had when Professor Ferguson took the stand. We had a very strange set of questions which insisted that Professor Ferguson hadn't been a big enough advocate for lockdown, that he hadn't done enough to warn the government. Now, there are lots of things that you can level at what he was called at the time Professor Lockdown, but the idea that he wasn't encouraging lockdown or wasn't making this information clear to government is just certainly not one of them. Indeed, he was messaging, emailing number 10, almost acknowledging that that was a bit above and beyond his remit, but he wanted to let them know his views on the situation and, and how strongly uh, he felt uh, about the need for intervention. So this idea that of all people, Professor Ferguson is being asked why he didn't do enough to advocate lockdown, I think does suggest that there's a particular uh, set of ideas and of a very narrow interpretation of the so-called science, which I know, I know Carl gets into in his piece for the magazine this week, uh, that they really want to, to advocate for in this inquiry. And it's not obvious to me whatsoever that that is the right way to be going about this. We, we need to be questioning every assumption that was made. We need to be questioning every bit of policy and law that was implemented around this, whether or not it yielded the right results, not simply did they do it too loosely? Should it have been harder and should it have been faster? And we should say at this point, Carl, as well as writing about the inquiry for us this week, you've also appeared in front of the inquiry, which was which was last week. Um, when you were in front of the inquiry, did you get the sense, as Kate says there, that, that the inquiry was coming from a very particular ideological bent and the questions to you were more about imposing that ideology than, than finding out what, what needed to be found out? So, yeah, look, I think Kate's got it spot on, actually. But let, let me just explain what happened is I was asked to submit written evidence. And that written evidence was about 74 pages, about 23,000 words. I tried to keep it succinct because I could have carried on for quite some time. And in that evidence, there were about 12 issues that were identified. I was going to go to the inquiry and ask to be uh, an oral witness and present and talk about. I actually thought we was going to go there and give an, a, a position to start to unpick some of these issues. Why is the mathematical modelling used so much, given its track record of getting it so wrong? Why are we using that? And actually, if you look at the inquiry, it seems to be saying the modelling is de facto evidence and not actually looking at the assumptions that go into it and saying, well, actually, every prediction in the in the whole COVID pandemic was incorrect. But what happened when it got there was something that actually concerned me. My evidence was cut short and about 20 minutes before they introduced a load of new documents and said, we're gonna discuss this and we're gonna start to go into your character, who you are, who, why am I there to make decisions and influence the issues, if you like? And that's largely because of what happened on the 20th of September when Sinetra Gupta, myself, and Anders Tegnell met with the Prime Minister to discuss the issues at hand. And I, I, I discussed this, actually, within the article. There are over 200 sage advisors. Yet within those advisors, they couldn't find somebody to provide an alternative viewpoint or actually robustly ask questions about the assumptions and the data we were using to that point. So actually, when you look at the inquiry, it's failing to ask the important question. Particularly, do lockdowns work? Should we do lockdowns next time? If so, what sort of evidence should we base them on? And particularly, what are the widespread harms that occur when you do lockdown that actually you need to take into account that would then give you what happens in healthcare is a normal is to take a, a, a basis of a decision based on the net benefit to harm ratio. And if the harms outweigh the benefits, you don't go there. Mm. I mean, Carl, at the inquiry, you kind of asked a bit about your own credentials and whether or not you're qualified to speak about this kind of thing. Do you think that's kind of part of 
part of the problem mindset, perhaps, that the, the inquiry wants to sort of label people into good and bad scientists and decide which are the good ones we should listen to? Well, it certainly felt that way because other witnesses who've gone there have been able to lay out the whole of their credibility. But what they wanted to do was go, here's what you published in 2018, 19. And you didn't publish on SARS-CoV-2, by the way. And I go, well, nobody was publishing on that. But at that moment in time, I was BMJ editor in chief. I totally revamped the journal and created a new series about healthcare decision making. It also didn't go back into my past experience and particularly say, I'm an active clinician. I've actually worked in the past pandemic, looking at swine flu, government appearances. It dismissed all that. And i that's the point when you're in a position like that and you're under the caution effect. What happened is I suddenly realized there was a change of direction here. This is not feeling as though I'm here to establish the truth. It's more to undermine my credibility. And what happens in that position, I think, all you can ever do is try and get out there with your reputation intact because it felt like nobody was listening and all I was doing was being under attack and I think what they really wanted me to do was lose my call and then use that to discredit a certain viewpoint. I think that was unacceptable. There is a real story to be told and evidence to be brought forward by what we call the other side, but actually those who want to produce an evidence-based approach. And actually, I was the only witness that's called from that position. Despite the fact, I think, the public, huge swathes of the media, understand that's an important discussion and debate that has to be had. Mm. OK, I think that brings us nicely on to what happened during the inquiry this week, and in particular, the inquiry's focus on bad language, uh, abusive statements made by various people privately inside Number 10 and out. Um, why do you think there's been such that focus by the inquiry on sort of on name calling rather than perhaps more substantive issues? It's almost as if, John, the inquiry thinks that the news is in the fact that these rude words were bandied about and that these messages were sent. I'm, I'm not going to repeat most of them. I know Carl had one um, directed at him, which was extreme, extremely rude uh, by Professor Dame Angela McLean, uh, who's now the chief scientific advisor. Uh, I won't repeat that one, but she also called Rishi Sunak Dr. Death in relation to his eat out to help out policy. Um, and of course, this makes for great politics. But in my opinion, the news is not actually these rude words that were used. We can talk about the tone and, and the attitudes within government, sure, we talk about that all the time. The real question is, you know, put the, put the rude words aside. Were any of these attacks or claims justified? What did Eat Out to Help Out really do? Uh, was questioning some of that modeling at the time the right or wrong thing to do? My frustration with this inquiry is that the focus is on personalities and individuals. That's easy because a lot of the individuals and personalities involved are, um, you know, truly spectacular and it makes for good television. It makes for a good inquiry. Um, but if we want to have a better, more robust policy when it comes to pandemics in the future, the question that's been on my mind and continues to be on my mind, and I haven't had any answers to yet, is were those models and were the assumptions going into those models correct? You know, if we just take one example, Sage was saying that at the height um, of COVID, you would have 90,000 hospital beds with ventilators needed. I think at the peak, it was closer to 2,500 and almost half of the ventilators on the NHS weren't used. I want to know names aside, you know, rude comments aside, whether or not um, we think that it was right to question those models, whether we think enough people did question those models, whether with Eat Out to Help Out, the right trade-offs were ever considered between the pandemic and every other aspect of society and public life and every other illness that people were suffering from that was keeping them away from the NHS, that was leading people to lose their jobs and the rest of it. Um, we have not gotten into the details of that. Instead, the explosive news stories from the perspective of the inquiry seem to be who called what when. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it makes for good television, but frankly, it's not, I don't think it's making us any safer for the future when the next pandemic comes along. Let's be clear, the language that's being used is completely unacceptable. And what needs to happen is it needs to be called out. What we think should happen now is all these diaries and all these WhatsApp messages should just be published in full. And then there should be a statement across government to say, this is completely unacceptable. And actually, there needs to be a change in culture. You just wouldn't accept that in the workplace. So why should we accept it at the head of government? 
the second point, once you've dismissed with that, then we can get back to the business of understanding what the lessons should be learned. That's what we're about. And that's what the inquiry is about. Second, I wanted to make a point about Dominic Cummings and both Neil Ferguson were asked about why they broke lockdown. And they went into apologetic mode and said, well, sorry. But the point isn't, that's not the point. The point that should be looked at to is with people who broke lockdown and had parties, surely there was a mismatch between the fear messaging they were producing and how they were behaving in the real world. So they could not or believed the messages and the risks that were being put out to the public. Because would you go and break them if there was a killer virus out there? Certainly not. And this is the key issue in the in the inquiry to me is, do you need legal restrictions to mandate people to do things? Or as in Sweden, can you trust the population to understand the risks and behave appropriately? And therefore, that's where, when you look at ICU capacity and all that, somebody should have brought in, and Ferguson did do a model for Sweden. That was incorrect because you can see that because they didn't lock down. Now, bringing in the Swedish data starts to allow you to show the incorrectness of the modelling approach because it all breaks down when you've got a control group like Sweden. Why is that not happening? Because we're completely distracted by this messaging of which I assume is going to be more and more, apart from the Scottish inquiry bit of this inquiry, because it seems they've deleted all their messages, which again is wholly inappropriate, because government should be transparent. And a good example of this is what happens in the USA. Because in the USA, all of the devices and all the emails have to be kept in full. And just like Hillary Clinton, she was in deep trouble when she started to use private emails. So they shouldn't be performing government functions in the background and deleting messages. They should be open in the in the public arena. Mm. Uh, Kate, on, on Carl's point there about the Sweden comparisons particularly, I mean, Obviously, it's not entirely conclusive at this stage, but it does look as though Sweden has done particularly well on excess deaths, which is one of the the better ways of measuring how countries did in the pandemic. Do you get the sense that the inquiry has been particularly good at looking at international comparisons, perhaps? Or do you think it's it's a bit too myopic at this stage and just very much focused on what was going on inside number 10 rather than looking elsewhere? It's very much focused on what was going on inside number 10. And look, I'm very happy to keep the government accountable. I think I'm one of the handful of people left in the UK that is still infuriated every day by Partygate. The fact that, as Carl says, people were living one way and instructing and actually sending the police after people if they dare to do anything similar. So I'm all for keeping government accountable here. But the wider point about public safety and real public health is whether or not the right decisions were made to keep the largest number of people alive and healthy. Um, And there's been a lot of scrutiny, for example, around one of Boris Johnson's messages this week. It's been put to Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane from the WhatsApps, where he uses frankly, crass language to talk about COVID, but questions whether or not more lockdowns are necessary given the fact that the average age of somebody passing away from COVID is above the average life expectancy age. He's asking questions about NHS capacity. Again, the news story is that Boris Johnson writes this in a rather crass way. If you break down what he's asking, they are very, very legitimate points. We should have been looking at quality numbers, the quality of life for years lost. We should have been looking at the impact on excess deaths, deaths, not just COVID deaths, because we are now in a situation with a 7.6 million waiting list on NHS England alone, where the NHS is truly overwhelmed, where you have people who are very young finding out that they have developed cancer. You have tragic situations now because of that very extreme stay-at-home messaging. I think what countries like Sweden taught us is is not that people were going to keep going about their daily lives when we had this new mystery virus going around, but actually that you don't always need to bring in the harshest laws, that you can trust people to make cautious, good decisions, and that actually that trust that Sweden put in their public has led to fewer people dying overall. You know, that that is a hugely positive thing and something that we have to take away for the next pandemic. But unfortunately, comments based on the way that they're worded in these WhatsApp messages are being scrutinized for you know very surface level kinds of language. They're not being scrutinized for the actual content of it, uh, which is clearly what we should be doing. And unfortunately, it's just not happening yet. And, and finally, to finish this off, Carl, I mean, COVID probably won't be the last pandemic that happens, hopefully, hopefully nothing like it in, in the immediate future. But do you get the sense 
after sort of participating with the inquiry and been writing for us this week, that the country is any is going to have learned any of the lessons from the past few years the next time a pandemic comes along. Do you mind if I come in on the excess death issues you mentioned about where we are? Because it's it is crucial, and I and sorry to no, of course, no, go ahead. Look, as we sit here about just over three years into the pandemic, three and a half, and it's come to an end, there are countries that have done really well in that period. One of them's Denmark. They have no excess deaths when you look at their data, and it's quite interesting. It's really interesting. I've been looking to them. Well, they have an amazing social care provision, I consider, that actually is worth looking at. But there are countries that have done badly, like Belgium, which is generally because I think they've got an incredibly poor care home sector. So it's that issue at, at the expect, at looking at the extremes will allow you to understand what's going on. But if we look at the data, say in England, and I wanted this is one of the things in in the round. There's about 165,000 excess deaths over the three and a half years. Yeah. Now, importantly, if you look in hospitals, there's about 60,000 excess deaths. But actually, if you count the number of COVID deaths, there's 140,000. So if you looked at the COVID death, you just go, oh, 140,000 deaths in hospital. And then you equate that to excess. That's a mistake. But there is one area where there's an excess death problem, which I think reveals an awful lot that needs to be looked at. And you can look at this on the Office for Health and Income Disparities, Improvement and Disparities website. It's a great website, provides you with the data and the images. In the home, there was 108,000 excess deaths of which only 12,800, about 12% were down to COVID. That can't be an underreporting because we're testing everybody on the death certificates, we're more likely to do it. So the story of this pandemic, the restrictions and everything we've done is that there's been a huge excess deaths in our own homes that not nearly 90% of it is not down to COVID. So if we were gonna learn a lesson, we'd start to break down the data dive into it and go, well, what's going on? And then the government would go, let's investigate what's going on and understand the drivers so we can learn lessons. And in doing so, that's how an inquiry would get to somewhere near the truth. But like you say is, it doesn't seem to want to go there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Carl. And thank you, Kate. Mm-hmm.